What is the gospel of the Bible? I'm sure you've probably heard the term gospel used before. You may have heard the saying to take something as gospel, meaning that whatever that something is can be trusted as an absolute truth. You may have heard of gospel singing, which Google describes as a fervent style of black American evangelical religious singing. However, that is not what we're looking at tonight. Tonight we're going to look at the gospel found in the Bible. Put very simply, the word gospel means good news. The dictionary definition of, for the New Testament word is up there on the screen. Don't ask me to pronounce the to pronounce the Greek, but clearly this word carries the meaning of good news. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't think I need to stand up here to tell you how desperately we need good news. Anyone who spends any time looking at the news knows that we hear a lot of bad news in this world. Up there on the screen is just a few of the top articles from the Nine News website, which I had a brief look at the other day. As you can see, there's nothing positive up there. This, this can get us down, and often we long to hear a good news story. So tonight we're going to look at some really good news. Not just a nice story, but something that can affect each and every one of our lives. As Christadelphians, this gospel is our hope, and that is what we want to share with you this evening. So if the gospel is good news, then a logical question to ask would be, well, what is that good news about? So... In order to best answer this question, we should begin by looking at the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you'll turn up with me to the beginning of the book of Mark, we'll begin our considerations of the gospel message by looking at the beginning of Jesus Christ's ministry on the earth. We'll just turn up to Mark chapter 1. So if you're at Mark 1, we'll read verse 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Jesus Christ was to bring good news to this world, and his teachings were the gospel as we know it. So the ministry of Jesus Christ would certainly be a good place to start when considering this gospel message. Uh, if you'll just cast your eyes over to the next page, later on in this chapter we read in verse 14 and 15, that Mark tells us how Jesus began his preaching activities. John the Baptist had now finished his work and was put in prison, and Jesus was now to begin his ministry. Mark writes, Now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came out into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. So what was the gospel that Jesus preached? Well, let's just have a quick look at a couple of verses up on the screen. We've already read Mark chapter 1 there. We've got Matthew 4 and Matthew 9. In all of these we can see it's the gospel of the kingdom of God. Gospel of the kingdom. Gospel of the kingdom. As we can see from these quotes up on the screen, the gospel that Jesus preached was about the coming kingdom of God. We find further on in his ministry that Jesus also prophesied that his disciples would continue to preach this same gospel of the kingdom. In Matthew 24 verse 14 we read, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. Having finished his work on this earth, Jesus Christ ascended to heaven, leaving his disciples a commission to continue preaching the gospel which he had taught. This work of Christ's disciples is recorded in the book titled The Acts of the Apostles. The disciples who were the followers of Jesus Christ later became known as the apostles, so hence the name of the book. Got up on the slide there, just a couple of verses from this book, Acts, looking at the preaching of the apostles. In Acts 8, we read of the preaching of the apostle Philip. Let's read verse 12. But when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptised, both men and women. Interestingly, you may ask why I've used this quote, as it doesn't actually mention the word gospel. Well, the word preaching there in verse 12 is actually the verb form used for the word gospel. So it really should read, Philip preaching the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. As you can see, there are two elements here to the teaching of the apostles. 
One, the kingdom of God, and two, the things concerning Jesus Christ. And tonight we aim to briefly consider each of these two elements, as this constitutes the entire teaching of the gospel. One apostle who tirelessly worked to preach this gospel, as commanded by his Lord Jesus, was the Apostle Paul. At the end of this book of Acts, in chapter 28, verse 30 to 31, we read of Paul, And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house, and received all that came in unto them, preaching the, God, the kingdom of God and those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ, with all confidence, no man forbidding him. Again, it is clear that the teaching of the gospel involves these two elements, which we saw in that previous verse we looked at. The teaching of the gospel is found right throughout the Bible. And it would be easy to spend several evenings looking at just the teachings about the kingdom of God. But for now, I'd like to just look at a few passages to give us an idea of what this kingdom is going to be like. One well-known quote that talks about God's kingdom is contained within the Lord's Prayer, which we find in Matthew chapter 6. This quote is up on the screen, so there's, there's no need to worry about turning that one up. Although this section is actually a model prayer which the Lord Jesus Christ gives to his disciples, within it we find a few key teachings about the kingdom of God. Our Lord prays, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. From this simple sentence, we can glean a few critical facts about the kingdom. One, the kingdom belongs to God. It is his kingdom. And we also see that in the last verse of that prayer. Two, the kingdom of God will be on earth. And three, in that kingdom, God's will or purpose will be done on earth, just as it is in heaven. When God's purpose is done on earth, the earth will be ruled God's way and will be filled with the qualities that are important to God. Justice, fairness, kindness, mercy and perfection, both in the natural world and in people's morals, just to name a few things. These attributes of God partly make up what is termed as God's righteousness in the Bible, if that's not a term that you're familiar with. God's values will be exhibited by those in the government and also by all those in God's kingdom. Right now, our world is filled with political corruption. In our world, there are many fault politicians fighting for power and popularity. Politicians cannot agree on many issues, but they all want their say. And as a result, many politicians use lies, empty promises and corruption in order to gain power. Many leaders abuse their power by cruelly treating their people, leading to poverty and unfair justice systems. In the kingdom of God, there will be one king and all the world will be subject to him. They will not be subject to him through fear as in the case of past dictators that we've seen in this world, but all the world will be subject to him because he will be a perfect king and they will want him to be a king over them. Jesus Christ himself will be the king over God's kingdom on earth. We know this from a statement which he himself made when asked if he was a king. Here he said, To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world. So we know that Jesus Christ was born to be a king. But he didn't reign as a king when he came to the earth some 2,000 years ago, or when he was on the earth some 2,000 years ago, I should say. He has not reigned as a king yet, so it follows that he must reign as a king in that future kingdom of God, which is yet to be set up. In fact, this is the subject of our next quote, which is Psalm 72, which speaks about the future rule of Jesus Christ. If you're happy to turn up with, with me to Psalm 72, let's go to that, that psalm and we'll have a look at what the world will be like when Jesus Christ is the King. So, Psalm 72 begins like this in verse 1. Give the King thy judgments, O God, and thy righteousness unto the king's son. As we can see, this psalm is about a king. And as we will see, this psalm talks about the things that that king will do when he's in power. We'll see that later on when we read, read a bit more in this chapter. The little subheading at the beginning of the psalm, if, you're just, if you've got the Oxford Bible like me and you turn back the page, you'll see that the, the little subheading says that this psalm was written for Solomon. 
We also know that this psalm was written by his father David from the last verse of the psalm, which tells us that this was David's final psalm. So we can clearly see that this was a psalm written by David for his son Solomon. However, interestingly, the king which this psalm is about is clearly neither David or Solomon. There are a couple of reasons for this. In verse 8 and 9, we are told that this king would have dominion from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Now, we know that both David and Solomon ruled over the entire nation of Israel. However, that is the only nation that was under their rule. The king in this chapter is to rule over the entire earth, something that no king has ever done before. On top of this, verse 17 also talks about the name of this king enduring forever, along with a similar phrase in verse 19. Both David and Solomon have now died, and we have recorded the length of each of their reigns. So this king we see is going to rule forever, which is something that is only possible in the future kingdom of God. So for these, these reasons here, it is clear that this psalm can only be speaking about the future reign of Jesus Christ. So having established this, let's have a look in a little bit further detail what, what Jesus Christ will do as a king. We've read in verse 1, uh, already we've read verse 1, which talks about God's righteousness in context of this king. This is interesting because we've already spoken about God's righteousness earlier, being his values and his qualities. And here we see that his son, Jesus Christ, will be ruling with the same values that make up who God is. So to see what his rule will be like, let's start by reading verses 2 to verse 4. And I'll read that for you now. He shall judge thy people with righteousness, and thy poor with judgment. The mountains shall bring peace to the people, and the little hills by righteousness. He shall judge the poor of the people, and he shall save the children of the needy, and shall break in pieces the oppressor. How amazing will that be? As well as being the king, Jesus Christ will be the judge in this kingdom. But unlike the justice system that we have in our world, Jesus Christ will be a perfect, flawless judge. There will be no more corruption or perverted justice in the world, and all people will be treated fairly. Moving on, verse 6 tells us that his rule will be like rain on mown grasses and like showers that water the earth. Here we have a beautiful word picture of what the kingdom of God will be like. If you imagine the first rain soaking into the dry, parched ground after a long Australian summer, in the same way, Jesus Christ's reign will bring a much-needed refreshment to the people of the world. To complement the moral changes that Jesus Christ will bring about in the world, there will also be physical changes in the earth, reflecting God's righteousness in a natural sense. Let's skip over to uh, verse 16, and I'll read that for you. There shall be a handful of corn in the earth upon the top of the mountains, the fruit thereof shall shake like Lebanon, and they of the city shall flourish like grass of the earth. In God's kingdom, the earth will be much more productive, producing food in places that were previously unproductive. As a result, there will be no more poverty or starvation in the earth. It is really sad right now to realise that many people starve in this world because the world's food is not shared fairly. We can see from this psalm and many other places that one of the most important things that Jesus Christ will do is to ensure that the poor in this world are provided for. When Jesus was on the earth, one of the things that made him the most upset and angry was seeing that there were people who oppressed those in need and that there were some who went without <clears throat> as a result. It will be the highest priority to Jesus Christ to write this when he returns. In fact, as we read in verse 4, he will personally destroy those who oppress the poor and the needy. It will be an amazing time to, to see a time when this perfect justice will be done on the earth. To see those who have been so unfairly treated eating a good solid meal and justice done for those who have been oppressed. I'll be more than happy to spend some more time talking to you about this awesome topic because it is this kingdom that makes up our hope as Christadelphians. But as, we, as I hope we've seen, it is clear that the kingdom of God will be perfection on the earth and a time that I'm sure we would all love to be a part of. 
However, ladies and gentlemen, we all have a problem that we must address. If the kingdom of God is going to be perfection on the earth, then we have a big problem because we are not perfect people. We know that God is perfect. He tells us that in the Bible, but we are not perfect. We are all selfish at times. We all get envious of others. We covet things which are not ours. We all tell lies and at times we hate others and we hold grudges. Some people steal and cheat and kill. Every one of us goes against the perfect ideals which God has commanded. When we break God's commandments in any way, we are sinning. And as a result of our sins, we are all dying. The Apostle Paul makes this point very clear in Romans 6 verse 23, where he writes, For the wages of sin is death. Sin is a problem that all humans have had since the beginning of the human race. The very first man that God created were Adam and Eve. When God created Adam and Eve, they were not dying humans like we are. In the early part of Genesis, God gave them one commandment which they were not to break. God told them that if they broke that commandment, the punishment would be that they would become dying people. Adam and Eve committed the first sin ever when they broke this commandment of God. And as a result, they became dying people. Since that time, all humans have sinned. And as a result, all people have either died or are going to die. Because of sin, we do not live up to the perfect ideals which will make up God's kingdom. This is the great problem that we all have. In fact, the Apostle Paul picks up this exact problem in the reading which Shem read for us tonight. If you come over to our reading in 1 Corinthians 15, we'll have a look at verse 50. Now, I know Shem didn't read that for us tonight, um, but nonetheless, it will be valuable to have a look at verse 50. So in verse 50, Paul says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither does, doth corruption inherit incorruption. Flesh and blood here refers to the dying body that we all have. We cannot be a part of God's everlasting kingdom as we are. That's what Paul's saying. We cannot be a part of this kingdom as we are because we all sin and we all die. So this brings us to the second part of the gospel message, being the work of Jesus Christ. If you turn back the page with me to the start of 1 Corinthians 15, which was obviously our reading for tonight, we'll see this exactly what our chapter for tonight is about. So verse 1. Paul says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. In this chapter, Paul intends to explain the key features of the gospel message. Paul explains to us, well, he, he will explain to us the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, which we will see is able to overcome our failings. So Paul goes on in verse 2, By which also ye are saved. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. The gospel offers us a way to be saved from our problem of sin. The problem which, as we have seen, results in death, and which we have also seen distances us from the kingdom of God. So let's go on into verse 3, where the Apostle Paul begins his explanation of the gospel message. Excuse me for a second while I grab a drink. Verse 3. For I delivered unto you first that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Ladies and gentlemen, God allowed his son, who lived a perfect life, to be brutally murdered as a sacrifice so that we might be forgiven of our sins. This was the ultimate selfless act of kindness, that a man was prepared to die to save others. Because of his sacrifice, we can be forgiven where we break God's commandments, and we can be seen as perfect in the eyes of God. A sacrifice like this should impact our hearts and should compel us to respond, which is something we're going to have a look at a little bit later. So we'll come back to that later. But Paul goes on in verse 4. Having told us that Jesus Christ died, he goes on, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Jesus Christ died that our sins might be forgiven. 
but he was a perfect man and he himself did not deserve to die. In fact, we are told in the Bible that the grave could not hold him. As Paul explains here, after having been buried in the grave for three days, God raised his son from the dead. And just in case anyone in this group of believers that Paul was writing to doubted this fact, the apostle goes on to explain how, Paul, how Christ had shown himself to more than 500 brethren Sorry, Mr. Slide change there. More than 500 brethren after he was raised, including Peter, the 12 disciples, James, and Paul himself. So whilst Christ allowed himself to die that our sins might be forgiven, this would have meant nothing if he was not raised from the dead. In verse 14, Paul puts this issue very bluntly. He says, If Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. This word vain here simply means empty. If Jesus Christ was not raised from the dead, then our faith is empty. It is pointless, it means nothing. Jesus Christ was a perfect man who had never sinned. If he was not resurrected, then we have no chance. The Apostle Paul makes it clear that if Jesus Christ was not raised, then there is no resurrection of the dead. There is hope for us though, ladies and gentlemen, because we have faith that Jesus Christ did rise from the dead. And we too can have a hope of being raised from the dead, just as he was. So let's read verse 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits, uh, and become the first fruits of them that slept. The first fruits here mentioned were the first ripe grain in the time of harvest. Jesus Christ was raised from the dead and given eternal life. And in the same way, his disciples who have died can also be raised from the dead. Paul goes on in verse 23 to explain to us when this will happen. He says, but every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, and afterward they that are Christ's at his coming. When Jesus Christ returns to the earth, those of Christ's followers who have died will be raised from the dead and can have eternal life with him. If you wonder what it means to be Christ's, just hold that thought for a minute because we'll, we'll come back to that later on. Um, but, but for now, let's just finish our look at 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, and to do that, I'll just read verse 25 and 26. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. When the disciples of Christ are given this gift of eternal life, they will not die again. Having reversed this cycle of death, which has been around as we saw for 6,000 years since Adam and Eve, Jesus Christ will finally destroy the power of death. This is an amazing promise. And shortly, ladies and gentlemen, we will have a look at how we can be the recipients of this promise. But first, I'd like to just briefly summarise what Paul has explained for us in 1 Corinthians 15. So up on the slide, I've just got four key points from, from, first, from what we've looked at in 1 Corinthians 15 there. First of all, we have all sinned and we are all worthy of death. We saw in verse 50 that this problem means that we do not deserve to be in the kingdom of God. Point number two, Jesus Christ died for our sins. Through his sacrifice, we can have the forgiveness of sins. And we will have a look later on at our response to this sacrifice. Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, is point number three there. Those of his disciples, those who are his disciples who have died before his return, can be raised from the dead just as he was. And number four, he will give his disciples eternal life. And in doing so, as we've seen, he will finally destroy that power of death. So that, ladies, <clears throat> excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, is the second part of the gospel in a nutshell. So if you don't mind coming back with me just to verse 50, we'll, we'll have a little look at that problem that we started with, where we saw that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And I hope we've seen that through the work of Jesus Christ, we can have our sins forgiven and we can have life eternal. And through the kindness and the mercy of God, we can be a part of that awesome kingdom, which we looked at earlier. So to put it really simply, the gospel message is one, 
the kingdom of God, and two, the way that we can be a part of it, which we've seen is through the work of Jesus Christ. Now, if you don't mind, for just a few minutes, I'd like to go back to the Old Testament to show that the gospel has been extended to mankind from the beginning. It's not just been exclusive to those born within the last 2,000 years. And whilst the word gospel is only found in the New Testament, the theme of the gospel message is a theme that runs right from the start of the Bible. And the gospel is not just a New Testament idea. So as I'm sure you realise, the chapter that I chose earlier to have a look at our to have a look at the kingdom of God, Psalm 72, is an Old Testament chapter. And whilst it is about Jesus Christ as the king, it was written well before Jesus Christ was born. I won't get you to turn up Psalm 72 again, but up on the screen we've got verse 17 of this chapter, where David actually references a promise that God made to a man called Abraham. Let's read verse 17. His name shall endure forever. His name shall be continued as long as the sun, and men shall be blessed in him. All nations shall call him blessed. In this verse, David makes reference to a promise which God made to a well-known Old Testament character, Abraham, all the way back in the book of Genesis, which we know as the first book of the Bible. Abraham was a very faithful man, and as a reward for his faithfulness, God made some amazing promises to Abraham about a future time to come. The promise which David makes reference to is recorded in Genesis 12 and verse 3, along with a very similar promise that God made to Abraham in Genesis 22 verse 18. Again, Genesis 12 verse 3 is up on the screen, so there's no need to turn it up. But in that verse, God promised Abraham that a time would come when all nations would be blessed or, put in simple terms, made happy. Clearly, this promise points forward to the kingdom of God because David references it in, in his psalm, which was talking about the kingdom. The Apostle Paul also makes a reference to this promise in Galatians 3 verse 8, which is a really interesting connection. So if you're still in 1 Corinthians, then it's probably worth just turning over a few pages and we'll have a look at this verse in Galatians chapter 3. Let's just start by reading the verse. And I'm going to read it from the NET version, which is on the screen, because I think that, that version makes it somewhat easier to understand. Galatians 3 verse 8. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, proclaimed the gospel to Abraham ahead of time, saying... All nations will be blessed in you. There's, so there's no doubt about it, ladies and gentlemen. This promise that God made to Abraham is the gospel message or the good news that we find in the New Testament. Paul says that, that God preached the gospel to Abraham. So what was it that would make all nations blessed or happy? Well, again, the Apostle Paul comes to the rescue here in the earlier part of the verse where he tells us, uh, that the promise to Abraham pointed forward to a time when God would justify the Gentiles. Um, the Gentiles is simply anyone who's not, uh, who is a non-Jewish person. To justify someone is actually the result of the forgiveness of sins, which is a concept we spoke about earlier. So when God forgives your sins or he forgives someone's sins, he no longer sees them as having done that sin. He sees them as perfect or just. And so in this way, that person is justified. So with the Apostle Paul's comments, we can see that thousands of years earlier in Genesis, God promised to Abraham that a time would come when God would forgive the sins of the Gentiles through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. So there it is. We've briefly looked at the two aspects of the gospel, and we've seen that each of those can be found in the Old Testament of the Bible. We've seen the teaching of the kingdom of God in Psalm 72 and a promise of the future work of Jesus Christ given to Abraham back in Genesis. The gospel is an amazing message. It truly is good news and it's something that I know we would all want to be a part of. But if you want to be involved in that amazing message, God requires a response from us. 
If you remember back a bit earlier, we saw that Jesus Christ gave up his life for us. Such an amazing selfless act like this requires a response from us. So what must we do if we wish to be saved by the work of Jesus Christ? Well, Jesus Christ himself gives us the answer when speaking to the disciples in a quote that most of us will know very well. This quote is Mark 16, verse 15 to 16, which I have up on the screen there. In Mark 16, Jesus Christ addressed his disciples before he was about to ascend into heaven and to leave them physically. Here, Jesus Christ commanded his disciples to continue preaching the gospel, which he himself had preached. Interestingly, we have a clear proof that these men kept their commission because here we are today. There are still some who know the gospel of Jesus, that Jesus Christ preached. And this truly is a testimony to the work of these apostles of Christ. So let's read it. Mark 16, verse 15 to 16. And he, which is Jesus, said unto them, his disciples, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptised shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be condemned. That's it. If we wish to be a part of the good news, then there are two things that God requires from us. First of all, we must believe the gospel message which Jesus Christ preached. This is the same gospel message that the disciples preached and the same gospel message that we've had a look at this evening. It's not a difficult message to understand, but we must truly have faith that Jesus Christ will return and that God will fulfill his promises. The second response that God requires of us is baptism. In our Bible address last week, we looked at what baptism was and we saw that baptism is a full immersion in water which is the clear teaching of the New Testament. You're more than welcome to have a look at last week's address if you want to have a deeper look at the idea of baptism. But put simply, in baptism, an individual chooses to identify with the Lord, with the Lord Jesus Christ, and they publicly show that in their act of baptism. When an individual goes under the water, it is like a burial. And in this way, the individual identifies with the death of Christ. If you remember back, I said to hold a thought at verse 23 of 1 Corinthians 15 about what it means to be Christ's. Well, if you want to know what it means to be Christ's, we belong to him once we identify with him in baptism. We are now his. And having identified with his death in baptism, we must then aim to live a selfless life like his, giving what we have for the sake of others. Ladies and gentlemen, if we do this and we follow Jesus Christ in his death and his life, we are his and we are promised that we can be raised from the dead and given eternal life with him when he returns to the earth. Thank you.